Right, so Phoenix's historical tours of IDS evasion. I will try and stand here because I know that there's a mic, but I'm very, very bad at walking that way. Good thing is that I'm very, very loud. Uh, so we should be okay. So, who am I? Well, I am a, uh, I'm a CTO, which so I proved that they really will give that job title to anyone. Uh, my name is Aaron. Uh, I work for a research lab. I work for a communications company. My research lab is owned by a communications company. This is how you can get a hold of me. I'm on Twitter. If you like trolling, that's probably a good place to be. And I blog occasionally at alba13.com. If you're wondering, that is me. Um, I know that this was a family conference, so I just wanted to make sure that I, I'm, I said that I lived in Scotland, uh, in Germany, but I come from Scotland, which means that anyone that knows Scots will know that culturally we're, uh, we're not adverse to using robust language. Um, so if there are any young people in the audience, it might not be the good talk to be into. Just consider me the Frankie Boyle of Steve Khan today, okay? <laughs> Moving on. So, what am I going to talk about today? We probably got, have you guys seen this picture before? This is an awesome picture, right? So, we're probably going to have a lot of people talk about human error. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the other corner. I'm going to talk about uh, detection systems, more to the point how we've screwed up over the years. Um, so, you, most of you probably dealt with Dave in one way, shape, or form. Um, Dave also works, by the way, in detection systems as well. We get a lot of screw-ups and that, so we'll talk about that today. So, I'm going to talk about network intrusion prevention systems. People think it's a dead technology. Um, I'm kind of, for the past, if it was a dead technology, I would have been talking about them for six years. Um, I would like to think when I first started that I would say a few things about it and people would listen after six years, not quite, uh, maybe we'll get there one day, but there's a lot of inherent problems. So we're going to talk about a little bit about the history of fail that we have. Uh, anyone that knows me knows that I've uh, picked on <coughs> vendors for a number of years, it's not likely to stop. Uh, there's probably a lot of people that didn't come to this talk because it's IPS. Um, Oh my god, it's a dead technology. They're broken. Yay! How many of you are pen testers? Raise your hand. Wow, I've come to a security conference and there's two pen testers. <laughs> right? These things are in deployment. How many of you, right? I learned this trick in Austria. So everyone raise your hand. Everyone. I will name and shame people have done. Okay. Keep your hand up if you've heard of PCI. Right, okay. So PCI makes you put in third-party application scanners, which are also detection systems. So they are out there, they're there quite a lot. Well, they've had a lot of issues over the years. Uh, protocols. Protocols are uh, they're very interesting things. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have the net. Uh, they are uh, a key part of what we do. I know I feel like I'm teaching you to suck eggs, I promise you. This is not going to be an OWASP talk with an XSS talk for 15 minutes. But, okay, protocols are a rudimentary part of what we do. Uh, however, there's a number of issues that happen with these things. Um, so in 96, uh, a paper came out by Peter Knudsen, which was the beginning of the end, as people like to call for detection systems. The final nail in the coffin, they said. It's funny how, you know, 15 years, 16 years later, we're still talking about this. So in this paper, they talked about protocol problems. So a protocol in the end gives us the ability to send data normally from one end to the other. Yay. So Peter Kanushan had a look at um, these IDS systems, how they do protocol normalization, uh, how they do protocol uh, inspection for threats. So an IDS system, We've had the same sales gimmicks in IDS for a long time, okay, which is, it will protect you from all the threats, don't worry, everything's safe. They've been doing this for about 40 years and they've been proven wrong time and time again. But we give them a blank pass. So, Peter Knutian start looking at some of the flaws. And if we look at protocols themselves, protocols are, can be quite complex. So, 96 happens, this paper comes out, uh, we all jump up and down, woo, and all of these evasion techniques come out to play. How many of you, raise all your hands again, you, you, you can raise your hands as well just because you guys came in, 
Everyone raise your hands. Right. How many of you have done web application testing? Right, okay. Directory self-referencing. How many of you have done this stuff? Right? This works in IDSs and has done. So how IDSs were working, they were using this great thing called static string analysis. What could possibly go wrong? We look in traffic for bad strings. If there's a bad string, we set the cyber fire alarms off and send the cyber fire trucks along, okay? So Peter Pinusian discovered that if you use dot dot slash dot dot slash and moved your payload along, that it surprisingly didn't match the uh, the static string. These, you know, these systems that would save you from the cyber fire and all this sort of stuff, right? Well, these are okay. These are a bit hinky, okay, but they're sort of within the, the spec of the of the uh, protocol. But what they also noticed was there was a lot of uh, <coughs> Using the protocol itself, some of the features of the protocol themselves could defeat IDS systems. So, compression was a very interesting invasion technique that was being used. So, when we use stuff like GZIP, so if you can imagine like a web, uh, like a web connection, you can compress the payload, which is kind of handy uh, because you know maybe you want to move some audio or some video or so on and so forth. Why not GZIP it and send it? How they uncompress on the other end, woo, yay, we get nice quick media. Now how this works, if you look in the headers for it, in gzip and uh, deflate, it will tell you the content length, which is really good for an IDS, because an IDS looks at a header, says, hey, I know that the next 35 bytes, or the next 35 kilobytes are going to be a gzip format, I will buffer this, and then I will inspect what's inside there for threats. Simple, no problems, really, really easy. So. We then look at HTTP chunked. Has any of you guys heard of HTTP chunked? It's a type of compression, slightly different from most compression types. So it doesn't give you a, uh, a content pack. So it just throws compressed data until it stops. So you can imagine for an IDS system, it really has two choices at this point, which is, do I keep on accepting all of this compressed data in the hope that it will end sometime soon, inspect it for bad files, and if I find something bad, set off the alarms, right? Or do I just accept a couple of bytes and then give up? What do you think they do? <laughs> I, can give you, I can give you two guesses, you're probably gonna need one, okay? So they tend to um, only accept maybe like 300 bytes in the first transmission. If they don't, this is where the real kind of fuck you happens in the deal, right? We can use HTTP chunked to turn off an IDS system. So we can, we can dot it. So if your IDS system allows you to keep on sending compressed data and it will buffer it, believe it or believe it not, IDSs only have a finite amount of resources, uh, we can start filling it up with junk. Well, you see this problem here, what, you can't turn it off. You can't, what do you do as a system admin faced with this? Well, the first solution, maybe, maybe we deny HTTP chunked. Maybe we put a rule in the firewall that says, if you see HTTP chunked, just drop that. We know what the problem is. How many of you are YouTube uh, users? Woo! <laughs> Goodbye, YouTube. The streamed media on the internet, how much of your users are going to love you now that no streamed media works? But this is the protocol of work. <coughs> Right, but a detection system has to be able to intercept data, understand it, and look for threats. And straight away, we're not doing anything hacker related here. We're just using the protocol HTTP in its designed format. Um, I'll give you a quick talk about some of the basic simple ones, which should just show you how shit these guys really were when they were developing IDSs. Static string analysis. So, if you, remember, if you can think about like a HTTP GET request in your head, right? You've got like GET, your web resource, 1.1, whatever, right? So GET, evil Russian web server dot ru forward slash evil payload dot html. And we've got a signature that looks for this, this, uh, this website, this, this site. So it turns out, while they were doing their testing, that if they changed the uh, version dot, so you know it says 1.1 or 1.0, right? 
they could, if they swap that for a comma, guess what? Static string analysis would not see the threat because they didn't have a string for it. So there's a reason why this works, and we'll explain why in a little while. So that's very interesting. This is the send conservatively, receive liberally. We'll talk about that issue in a minute. They also noticed, and that, if you're wondering, by the way, is the HTTP version of the invalid version of The next one is quite interesting is the random case HTTP. So we've talked about some of the stuff that's available within HTTP, which is kind of really dependent. These sort of, some of these evasion techniques are sort of really dependent on the platform that's being used. So most of you will know that uh, Windows and Linux have different ways of handling case sensitivity. So case sensitivity on a Windows system, we like to say it's uh, uh, insensitive to case. So you know, capitals, small cases don't make any difference. However, in, in Linux systems or Unix systems, it's a huge issue. Right? It means something different. So what these people realized is with this static string analysis, that if we went small case, lowercase, small case, lowercase, small case, lowercase, I'm sure some web app testers have done similar things as well, this would also bypass um, case sensitivity. This is another issue that you can't turn off because you're not sure about what the endpoint can and can't do and is likely to send and send. It's just a member in the middle of the network. So, and when we talk about this case sensitivity problem, we can do some kind of barroom mathematics in our head. If we see Apache, it's probably a Linux system. <coughs> yes, but unfortunately Apache works on Windows systems too. Well, Apache is case insensitive, depending if it's on a Windows system or not. So you can't just do header matching either and say, ah, oh, well, it's a Windows system. So it must mean it's case insensitive, so on and so forth. But these all invasion techniques all sell through these multi-million dollar industry uh, detection systems. Um, my favourite one, I think, out of all of this, have I got the, uh, the, the, the invalid uh, HTTP version? Have I put that up there? This is brilliant. So, HTTP, v, uh, HTTP goes up to 1.1, right? So these guys, it's this, is this send uh, conservatively receive liberally. I'll explain why I keep on saying that sentence in a minute. What the guys worked out was is that they could send like a, a HTTP get request, so get evil rep server .ru .evil payload .html 1.7 but we all know there isn't a such a thing as 1.7 what would happen is is the server would go ah, you've just fucked up you really mean 1.1 and it would serve the page but of course the static string didn't have a signature that covers that well maybe we could just write strings that go up to 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. .1 but if we can use version numbering, then I can make you write strings, the signatures, endlessly. Because hey, I've got numbers, and once I've got numbers, I've got huge possibilities. Kind of awesome. But once we talk about how you can use protocols, we can talk about the ambiguities of protocols as well. So RFCs. Request for comments are a really simple document that clearly lays out how you should implement a protocol, right? Yeah, not quite. You know, what's written by a man can be broken by a man quite easily. So, if we look at TCP IP, one of the most used rated protocols that we have today, right? It's a massive protocol everywhere. If you look at the protocol, there's actually a lot of grey areas. So we call people that implement protocols implementers. And some of those implementers are Windows or Microsoft, Unix, Apple, so on and so forth. They get a request for comments for TCP IP, and then they implement the request for protocols. So in that document, when they don't clearly lay out what they should do in certain situations, they leave it for an implementer to make their own mind up. What could possibly go wrong? Because we'll all make the same decision, won't we? Well, apparently not. So, um, an example of this, slightly off on a digress simply, but how many of you guys ever heard of the LED data leakage uh, vulnerability in routers? I'm surprised there's only one person, but it's be too beautiful, right? So, how do you know a route is working? I mean, not ping or anything like that, but you're looking at the route, how do you know it's working? Flashing lights. 
And how do you think they made those flashing lights work? Well, they just put them to the positive and negative of the network core. So, to give you a rough idea what that actually means is, is that all of those flashes are actually the binary data, the ones and zeros, the ons and offs of the network. So it turns out that for about $20, you can recreate the data stream with a camera. Bit of a fuck up, really. Uh, you know what's the really interesting thing about this? It's not that, A, someone had enough time to work that shit out, but the fact that they nearly all made the same mistake. Well, we're not so lucky in IDS. It would be nice if everyone made the same mistake. They all came up with different solutions. They came up, so in TCP IP, you can rewrite parts of the data stream, okay? It's been built to be a robust protocol. So you might, in transmission, want to change parts of that data stream. Like, hey, something's changed, and I want to do this, right? So you get these packets that overlap. We call these overlapping segments. Okay. However, the RFC can clearly define which data takes precedence. And what I mean by this is, if I send you some data and I overlap it with new data, does the old data or new data, which one is which one's king for the day? Right. Well, it turns out that when you leave Microsoft and Unix to come up with different decisions, they will come up with different decisions. So Windows favors old data over new data, and Linux favors new data over old data. And as an invasion technique, what this means that I can do is because an IDS is typically a passive member of the network that's kind of like a glass to the door listening to stuff. It's not really involved, it's not the end point. What it means is that I can build structures with data that look like one thing to the IDS, but are reassembled by the endpoint of something else. We call these insertion attacks. Okay? So we're able to insert a different kind of look on the data stream, knowing that our endpoint will change there. Okay? We also have a number of different issues with this. Send conservatively, receive liberally. I know you've heard me say this about five or six times. This is one of the biggest problems that we will face today and for a while. What we do is we teach implementers this. That you should send very, very tight in what you want to send out in a protocol. Okay? You should stick to the RFC as much as you can. Okay? In fact, it's like the law. right? Stick to it. Don't deviate. However, what you receive, be a little bit liberal about it. Okay? Because, you know, you sent 1.8. We don't want to drop the internet connection, so we're just going to serve you 1.1 because you obviously meant 1.1, right? So, if you think back to this poor little, it's not often you'll hear me say poor little IDS, but in this case you will. If you think back to this detection system, that the only way that it can understand protocols is the same document that the implementers used. And if they like, wander off the beaten path and go, well, you know, you put in a dot, you put in a comma, and you meant a dot, we're just going to serve you that page anyway. You can understand why the IPS all of a sudden gets a little bit lost and a little bit confused. This send conservatively, receive liberally, is an issue that we see in lots of places, a lot of the IDS evasion techniques. I know it sounds a little bit kind of out there, but I'll give you an example of where, where, where it really shouldn't work, where we send conservatively, receive liberally, the protocol is really clearly laid out, and yet implementers ignore the protocol because they uh, uh, are, are presuming you meant something else. An example of this is, this comes from Facebook. So, you have a protocol clearly lined out, <coughs> sometimes implementers are a little bit lazy. Who would have thunk it that? Ship it, ship it, ship it, ship it, get it to production, get it to production, get it to production, right? If it wasn't for that, we'd all be unemployed, right? So, it turns out, how many of you, raise your hands, how many of you have heard of Fitbit, keep your hands up? How many of you have used Fitbit? We know I haven't, look at me, right? So Fitbit is this thing, right? I, I can only tell you what I've read on the internet, because you can definitely see that I've never used it. But it counts your footsteps, okay? And then what it does is, I'm sure we've all followed someone on Twitter that has a, twi like a, a, a twi 
tweet that comes out saying, Joe Bloggs has walked three steps today and it's pushed to a cloud. Okay, woo! Social media, yay, awesome. You, you know, we, this is how we know I'm not using it. So it turns out their implementers are a little bit lazy and that they didn't put in a, uh, uh, a user agent screen in their HTTP GET request. So it stops all the data of how many footsteps that you've taken, pushes it off to the cloud, woo, the cloud someone else's computer, pushes that up there, okay? They haven't used the user agent string, clearly defined in the protocol that you need to use the user agent string. They've just ignored it, it gets accepted and it gets put on. However, this is the interesting thing. Who else is a little bit lazy at uh, uh, following the protocol when implementing things? But it may be malware authors not using user agent strings. So you can imagine that all of a sudden when you have all of your Fitbit stuff walking around, that all of these GET requests are going out with blank user agent strings. You can imagine what the IDS thing is going on. It's like, oh my god, we're being attacked by the Chinese, right? <laughs> Some fire trucks. Woo! Turns out, no. Lazy implementation. But the protocol quite clearly defines that you should be dropping this anyway. But if you do this, all your Fitbit staff are, are, are not happy. I'm not sure anyone would know this. But this is a theme that kind of carries on. This is not, you know, when the implementer kind of knows better than the protocol does. And trust me, this happens a lot. And then. I'm going to talk a little bit back about like, a good friend of mine, Steve Lord from 44Con, uh, tweeted me one day and said, the night is called, they want their frag flag and fragmentation caps back. And I said, fuck off, I'm still using them. And I am. And the problem is, is that this is just the simple stuff and protocols that I've talked about. Let's talk about some complex stuff and protocols, like flags. Okay? Because what we can do with flags is we can either screw up a flag, and in some cases that requires things to be dropped, and in some cases it just requires a response to go back. There's a number of things where you can use flags to cause problems on the other end. Um, and flags are kind of important. There's, there's a great story about invalid checksums and IPSs. So the IP protocol kind of clearly states that if the checksum for the packet is invalid, you drop it, right? No go, right? Turns out the IPS vendors were not following the protocol so much. So there was a load of these packets coming through with false IP checksums, right? And the IPS is like, yeah, you can go, no problems, not checking that, it's all good, don't worry, off you go. And all of these packets were getting to an internet facing router what do you think the first thing happened when it got to an internet facing router? All of those invalid checksum packets dropped. Well, that's camouflage, that's an insertion attack again. But this is done now on the, on the flat part of the, of the protocols. Um, this is very, it took them ages to work out exactly what was going on, but what they were doing is literally camouflaging very like, sensitive stuff going in and out, checksum issues. So now we've covered the Protocols can be complex. There's some stuff in protocols that we can't fix that we have to leave. Sometimes implementers don't follow the protocols. And even when they do follow the protocols, they ignore what they're supposed to do anyway. And all in, all in the middle, this dead technology that is a billion, billions of dollars per annum. Cisco purchased Sourcefire for $2.7 billion. Uh, that's not chump change, not even to Cisco. Um, you can see that this dead technology gets a lot of leverage, a lot of leeway. And what it is, is that as testers, as security professionals, we give it a blank pass. And I don't mean we give it a good blank pass. What we do is we say, ah, shit, doesn't stop anything. And then we don't do anything about it. We just let it be back. And then we just let it be deployed. And then we just ignore it. And meanwhile, all of this stuff takes decades to come out and find because we're not testing it properly. I talked about the old versus new issue. The old versus new issue is is a really interesting problem. This is these overlaying fragment stuff. Everything that I talked about, there is a way to fix. But it's a bit, how many of you have watched like Aliens, right? And there's the scene where Ripley says, we should nuke it from orbit, it's the only way to be sure. Well, the solution to this problem that I've discussed so far is exactly the same. 
Okay? It's called protocol normalization. Okay? So the real issue here is because we don't understand what the endpoint is going to see, right? We're just in the middle. So we don't know what the endpoint is sending and we don't know what the endpoint is receiving. We know how we fix that. We become the endpoint. Okay? So in protocol normalization, we rewrite the packets. Okay, the IPS takes them in and rewrites them. Let's have a second to think about this. This is the same industry that didn't check IP checksums. This is the same industry that can hardly follow a request for comments. And now, they're rewriting your data streams on the network. Two issues before we start. First, you have to be in line to do this. You cannot do it passively. How can you rewrite something that you're not in the middle of? Okay. The, I was on an assignment recently, of, well, I say recently, about 18 months ago. I talk about IDS testing and methodologies and how you should do it properly. And it's one of these tests, trust me, every now and again, it doesn't matter how much you preach, you always have to go and do one of those shitty tests, right? There's nothing you can do about it, it's just the way it is. And it's a secure location. There's a reason I don't live in this country anymore, because that scared the shit out of me. So, I was there. And you know it's a good test when the chaperone says to you, I could really do without this today. And I'm like, hey, like, I've traveled, caught on planes, all of this shit, but like, you can send me home, but we're bit. Like, it's simple as that, right? Oh, okay then. And it's a whole clusterfuck of things along the way. Like, I get in there, and I say to him, okay, take it to your data store, direct data center, show me your IPS. Walks in, opens his cage, and he says, I think it's this one. And I go, you think? Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you do any training? Well, no, what happened is, is a team came in, they walked in, they plugged it in, and went, see you later, mate, and walked back out there. So, all of his training was watching this flashy thing go into a cage. This IPS product, save you from all the zero days and apps and all of this shit, right? So, there's a whole host of things that go along. It's in line, blah, 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 blah. I say to them, at the end of the day, I said, do you, do you ever get network issues? Oh, yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, okay. So, uh, do you know that your IPS is protocol normalization deployed? N no. What, what, what does that mean? You see this box here? It's rewriting everything going in and out of your network. Really? Yeah. Do you, do you ever look at the logs when something goes wrong with it? <laughs> no. Hmm. I suggest you put that into your problem solving if I was you. Uh, okay. Now, obviously, the IPS hadn't caused a problem because some bright spot before then would have realized that the IPS was dropping everything. But these, this is a secured location. Just to be clear about this, dealing with some very, very sensitive data. Who had IPS in play, that had protocol normalization in play, and didn't have any training whatsoever at all and didn't know it. The real raison d'etre of this story is the best part at the end goes, so I've noticed that you've got it configured to do a thing called fail open. And what I mean by fail open is if we knock your IPS over, it becomes a router. Which is sort of the opposite of what you want to happen. If you want someone to attack your IPS, you kind of want it to take the network out so that you know someone's taken out your IPS. Right? Once it's dead, you kind of want to know that it's dead, it's sort of important information. You don't want to find that out a couple of weeks later. They say to me, oh, well, it's because we've got uh, an encrypted network underneath, two encrypted endpoints underneath, and uh, it's sensitive data that we do sharing with, and uh, we, we don't want it to fall over. And I say, well, why have you got an inline device? Why, why don't you just put a, a sensor and use an IDS? And they say to me, oh, well, that's what the vendor said that we needed. So they went to a salesman, and the salesman said, this is what you need, and they brought it. You have to question who the bigger idiot is in this, really. Do you know what I mean? That you go to a shop and you ask the salesman what you need, he gives it to you, and you don't ask any questions, you just buy it, and then use it religiously. This is exactly what happened here. But if any of you have ever worked with governments, you can actually know how this happens, because of the checklists that go through it. You can like get like a purchase from a like do a purchase through a government. It's like some vendor is sitting there going, woo, buying a boat. Do you know what I mean? Because 
What do I need to be to be this ISO standard? We need this, 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 this. Just sign here. <laughs> this is what happens. A lot of you had your hand up for the PCI stuff. How many of you guys work in PCI? Sorry about this. I get a phone call regularly about this particular instance, right? And it's all, it's not all PCI's fault, but for today, it's majority their fault, right? You know, if you get a client that says to you, we never get any false positives, right? I can tell you that they've configured their IPS wrong. I get, we never get any false positives. And I answer this with, do you ever get any true positives? No, we don't. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I say to them, don't tell me. Third party application scanner, right? Yeah. So, this is a beautiful incident that happens. Encrypted endpoint, encrypted endpoint, IPS. Right? With no means of decrypting the encrypted data stream. <laughs> Did I say that I deal with this like once a week? Right? This is not, this is not like happens on, a, on, a, on an unknown basis. This happens all the time. This happens in banks. Right? One of the main reasons that this happens, this is where I get to pick on PCI a little bit. Third party application scanner, not allowed to break an SSL tunnel. Well, what's the third, app, third party application scanner for then? Sounds good. And that's about it. They require you to have a third party application scanner, an IPS, right? But you're not allowed to break the encrypted tunnel. So what is the detection system looking at? Encrypted traffic. Hey, you won the Darwin Award. <laughs> you know that you're a sad detection geek when your friends call you up and tell you stories. My mate called me up and said to me, mate, you are never going to believe this. And I'm like, fuck about probably well. And he says, uh, I was just in, I was just in a client meeting with a senior network guy. I'm like, uh-huh. And they're having a real load balance issue with their IPS. I'm like, right, okay. He said he fucking recommended that they SSL all the stuff to take the load off the IPS. <laughs> the dude had used SSL as a load balancer for IPS. I'm just going to encrypt everything. Now take the load off the IPS. Just fucking turn it off. <laughs> Think green. <laughs> but the thing is, is this is how people think. This is the reality of it. No value because we don't test it properly. This is how these stupid things happen. Did I say that I deal with this so regularly? It makes me so, so mad. <laughs> right? This is probably the last person. You, if you call me up and tell me, now I've told you this and you speak to detection people, you, like, you speak to them, they will tell you that they deal with like, sensors in the middle of two encrypted endpoints. Trust me. Let's talk about de facto standards. So we clearly define what happens in clearly defined protocols. That we fuck that up so badly, let's talk about de facto protocols. De facto protocols are protocols that don't have RFCs, that are made by organizations like Microsoft. And they have this wonderful thing called SMB. How many of you have heard of SMB? Woo! Because corporate bill loves it. Who would have thought the businesses like to share documents. Shock horror, right? They love network shares. But this stuff isn't written in a document. It's not got an RFC. Okay? This is my... I know some of the Samba guys that tried to reverse engineer SMB. They're all slightly weird. I'm starting to realize why. Okay? SMB is complex. This is not the only de facto protocol. But I'm picking on this one because you all have experience with it. Here is just some of the SMB DCRPC fun, uh, evasion techniques. I am not going to talk about SMB pipe uh, IO because I've spent a long time talking about that. It's a clusterfuck of a huge proportion. But this shows you how screwed up. If you want to like, grab a chat with me about why this evasion technique is uh, very, very interesting, come and find me because that one's wow. <laughs> but, these evasion techniques are all because the protocol is not clearly defined. So that the detection system that is looking for threats is ultimately having to reverse engineer SMB. 
Well, that sounds good because they can't implement the stuff that is clearly defined. Now they have to work it out for themselves. So these are interesting. You can find all of these in Matasploit, by the way, if you want to have a play. And I'm sure we've all got Windows boxes and VMs that. <laughs> so these are interesting. This had a heyday recently. And this had a heyday recently because of a great organization uh, who I've picked on for a number of years. I'm going to do it again, Stonesoft. However, they've, uh, they've probably got a better class of lawyers now because they've been purchased by McAfee, I mean Intel. Uh, so, they scared the living bejeebas out of the detection industry about four or five years ago. Like, they just came running out and went, we've discovered advanced invasion techniques and everyone's vulnerable. And we went, shit, so what are they? We're not telling you. Hey? Eh? <laughs> Reasonable disclosure. Okay, who are you telling? The affected vendors. Who are they? We're not telling. So, we just take your word that you've got these vulnerable. Yeah, 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 yeah but we're all good. We, we're not vulnerable to them. Well, yeah, because your vulnerabilities are, I should fucking hope you're not vulnerable to them. So, for a couple of years, we had this cat and mouse game where Sony Soft didn't really tell anyone, anyone, anything. I managed to get a hold of some of the PCATs of their advanced evasion techniques. I worked out what was going on quite early on. <laughs> So, it turns out, would you like to know what an advanced evasion technique is? You're supposed to say yes at this point. Yes. You take one really old evasion technique and another really old evasion technique and you put them together. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is advanced. <laughs> well, what I can clearly tell is that their research team don't read that many papers. The Achilles detection here, the Achilles heel of detection systems, a very interesting uh, white paper on the use of evasion techniques in IDSs. Evasion techniques are fucking really easy to detect because how they work is how they're detected. You do something abnormal so that it, the IDS doesn't see it because it's not used to seeing it like that, and that goes through detection. But the abnormal bit is the easy bit. Right there, hey, no one sends that many fragments. That's something hinky going on. So they work for a very short space of time, and then sooner or later you work that shit out and it's fine. So web application testers, here's one for you. What happens if you put obfuscation on your obfuscation on your obfuscation? It looks a little bit weird, right? And that's what gets you caught. Well, this is exactly what happens here. So the Achilles heel of detection systems was a paper that was written that basically said for every evasion technique that you put in, you're six times, your, your increase is six times more likely. Because, and, and to be honest with you, this whole example proves a great point about this. So, back in the day, DCE RPC preprocessors in IDS were generally pretty shit, right? So, Stonesoft got DCE RPC fragmentation and they put it together with TCP segmentation. Well, TCP segmentation was pretty fucking good. So, what was happening was, they weren't picking up the DCE, the DCE RPC fragmentation, but picking up the TCP segmentation. The surface for detection gets bigger the more that you add on. The more that you obscure things, they start to look a little bit obscure. Who would have thought it? Well, someone who wrote a paper about it that Stonesoft never fucking read. They were completely surprised. I spoke to one of their researchers in Vienna, and Ah, oh, we've got this, and we did this, and we did this. And I says, well, when was the last time you ran, uh, it was Predator at the time, I'm not sure what they call it now, Evader, I think. And when did you run Evader over security on you? Because I can assure you, all of your advanced evasion techniques get detected in, in uh, security on you. We've never done that. Yeah, and here's you at a security conference talking about evasion techniques. Wow, your research is doing well. Um, and it gives you a rough idea. It's just marketing. But the worst thing is, we were the first to do it. No, you were. Actually, you could do this in Metasploit from like 2006. So, they fail. They, um, as I mentioned earlier on, they get purchased by, like, I miss John McAfee, by the way, just so we're clear about this. I really want him back in the game. The proudest moment of my life was not, you know, speaking at conferences or finding awesome evasion techniques. It was the day that John McAfee followed me on Twitter. I was like, come on, John, we could party, just don't shoot me, bro. 
But, so, StorySoft recently got purchased about 18 months ago from uh, McAvee. Well, what do we call them? Do we call them McAvee? Do we call them Intel, formerly known as McAvee? I mean, have they transitioned the name yet? What, what's the story with it? But they buy them for 200 million euros. So, woo, sounds a lot of money. And then you realize that it's 200 million euros, that's property, that's catalog, that's everything. Basically, McAvee slash Intel Broad Distribution Network. Um, even John McAvee isn't that fucking insane, but apparently Intel are. Then we watch Snort get purchased, sorry, Sourcefire get purchased by uh, Cisco. One of the great things about doing what I do is I get asked my opinion from, com from companies time and time again about certain things that happen. And, you know, Surprisingly, I didn't see this coming. We made a little bit of money out of the whole purchase of Cisco, to be honest with you, because a lot of people suddenly got a little bit panicked about their source fire ship. Like, oh, is it going to become unsupported? And they're like, well, you can get an answer from Cisco, and it's probably going to be somewhat true, but, you know, people want it independent. And what, I, what we were saying about the, the Intel purchase was, uh, the, so the Cisco purchase was, is it's probably going to make your products last a little bit longer. Um, because Cisco just doesn't move fast. They're like an oil tanker. You know, if they want to stop, it still takes them ages to slow down the momentum. But what we're probably going to see is we're probably going to see the same situation with Snort as we saw with Oracle and um, OpenOffice and so on and so forth. Where, don't worry, we'll take the open source project, we'll love it. And then about 18 months later, they cut the strings off and let the community have it. Which is exactly what's probably going to happen to Snort. Which means that we're probably going to see the rule set of these free rule sets become a little bit more diminished. Oh no! There is a benefit of this, right? That we're probably going to see the increase of um, independent signature author companies, right? Like emerging threats. There's a number of these businesses that are coming together. Like, Snort signatures are like a universal language for writing IDS signatures. They're not going to disappear. But, now we're going to get lots of little independent research firms where you can like buy snort signatures. Emerging threats sell SCADA signatures for snort. You don't get very much banned for your buck, but they do. We'll see, um, my presumption is in the next couple of years we'll see an increase in this. Hopefully, I'm right, otherwise you'll all get to laugh your ass off me in five years' time. I'm going to wrap up because I'm running out of time, but I'm going to talk about two interesting stories. I'm kind of old-fashioned. That I believe in detection, that once you detect something, you should always fucking detect it, right? If I detect the threat, I should detect it 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, a million times. Once I've detected it, I've detected it, right? Sweet. In fact, the common intrusion detection framework clearly states this too, right? Who would have thunk it? If you saw an arrow, and, and if you saw an evil payload, you would like to see that evil payload time and time again. So, here is a vendor. I haven't ranted about the cartel, about, you know, throughput, 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 throughput. The industry always talks about throughput, doesn't really talk about detection rates. It's a bit like uh, the sports car industry only talking about GPS systems, not how fast their cars go. Sort of the same thing happens in detection. So, there's a product with a buffer of a thousand threats great throughput, because they're only looking for a thousand things, right? A thousand threats, because they're popular threats, because hackers only use popular threats, right? So, what do you think happens when a new popular threat emerges? It gets added. What do you think happens to one off the end, just off it goes? So, it only ever has a thousand threats, and it pushes one of the, the uh, signatures out of the end, gone. So what you were protected against six months ago doesn't necessarily mean you're detected against anymore. <coughs> snort does have some race condition issues as well. If you fire a thousand threats at Snort and then do it again, you will find a slight discrepancy. If you kept on doing this, you will find a slight discrepancy between the detection rates. It's an interesting problem that we haven't kind of got an answer for. But back to this. This is a really bad idea because you go and do your vulnerability assessment or your pen test or whatever we're calling the security theater that we sell, 
And it doesn't necessarily mean that, we, you know, if we know, know that our company are looking at SMB threats, we might have just pushed our only SMB signature right out of the system, and we don't know. But don't worry, we're all safe. We've got great throughput, okay? My last little rant is about the kill chain. I know I'm running out of time, so... How many of you have heard of the kill chain? Fucking love this. <laughs> so the kill chain, you've got to love the army, right? This is, this is these guys' invention that's been brought into detection. Because what we really need is more boys' toys. So, the military worked out that a kill chain, when they wanted to kill people, like bad guys or illegal combatants or whatever the army call them nowadays, you know, the people that are doing bad things, right? Well, there's a whole process that kind of happens, right? It, you know, you don't just wish someone dead and boom, they're dead, right? You know, even if you're using drones, right? You, there's a whole process. Like, We've got to find intel. We've got to find location. We've got to find target. We've got to find resources. Dum, 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 dum. And if the army did not protect these chains, these links in the chain, then their mission would have probabilities of only success. So it was about making sure that they were effective in killing. And what they slowly realized was, holy shit, the bad guys. They have to use a kill chain to get to us. So they need to get guns and bullets. And they need to find the location. And they need to get boots on the ground. And they need to do all of these things that we need to do. So if we stop them from getting get bullets, haha, <laughs> they can't kill us. If we stop them from getting guns, they can't kill us. If they don't know where we are, they can't kill us. It starts to be used as a defensive process as well as an offensive process. Lockheed Martin come into play, who are uh, the literary contact. The cyber kill chain, I was very disappointed to find out it wasn't a chain that killed all the cybers, but the cyber kill chain, they basically worked out that what the military do, you can do in a network context. So if someone has these advanced persistent threats, you know these advanced persistent, it used to be that it was just someone t attacking you, but now we've got a three letter out of them for it being a person, not a worm. So, they have to find a target, they have to find an exploit, they have to get intel, they have to do da 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 There's a whole, they need a command and control center, they need this, they need this, and so on and so forth. All of these points are good points for detection. Hey, why is it that this place that registers like domain names for command and control, yeah, we've had a bit of scanning, then this got registered, then this happened, then this happened, this is a big indicator that, you know, Things are coming, you know? Like, say you're in an organization and a user logs on at their workstation at four o'clock in the morning. It's an interesting piece of information, but no one wants a phone call because someone's logged into their work computer, right? Like, no, no, we don't need to send a cyber fire truck, it's okay. Right? I don't need to be woken up for this, it's good. And then you find out that, hey, why is this IP address in our local network speaking to this IP address in the China net, in, in, in a Chinese network? You know, it's interesting, but maybe not let's send the cyber fire trucks just yet. Ah, it's, uh, it's downloading data blobs. You know, that maybe starts to raise some OMs. Well, but if you look at the kill chain, you can actually put parts of detection along the line to see what's happening here, like DNS workups. Are we having an increase in DNS lookups to uh, rogue IP addresses, so on and so forth? Very, very interesting concept. But what happened is we let the marketing machine take control, and that's when it all got fucked up. You will hear cyber kill chain over the next two to three years massively, okay? And if you're not going to hear that term, you're going to hear context awareness, right? Context is a really important thing in detection. But when we let the marketing people, you like apt. How do you feel when anyone says apt? You're kind of like, oh fuck. Or cyber, that's what you've noticed. I say these a lot just to kind of take the piss. <coughs> but we have this, this happens with kill chain. You speak to anyone that's had to do, deal with vendors. And it's like, cyber kill chain, kill chain, kill chain, kill me now, please put that chain around my throat. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you that 
We need more event source. We've got enough events. We don't do a good enough job with keeping a hold of the events that we have. <laughs> so I tell you why we don't need more events, we need more meaning. Why? Because pretty much soon we're gonna need a bigger fucking boat, right? <laughs> We can't get any more events than the events that we've got. We've got door systems telling those people around us. We've got communication chat logs. We've got file system changes. Da, 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 da. We've got all of these. But what we need to do is start putting these together to get bigger pictures, better pictures. You know, you have, you have vendors talking about anti-Snowden boxes and anti-Manning boxes, <laughs> right? But we laugh and joke about this, but the reality of it is, is that Manning downloaded 4.5 gigs of data as a single analyst, when printed out would fill two battleships in paper. And they still didn't get the meaning of what that meant, that not one person could have read all of that shit. But they still let it happen. Ah, oh, but they caught Manning. No, they didn't. He got grassed up. <laughs> but all of that events was there. They had those logging data. They just didn't have any meaning to it. So it's about rationalizing the meaning of, of, of the logs that we have. So, detection. Complex, don't give it a blank pass, okay? It is not a three hour job and a two day pen test, okay? If you do this, there is no return on investment for you or for your clients. If you want to make, pen if you want to make detection systems work, then they're an asset that requires you to give something to them. They are only as effective as the effort that you put in. If you spend two hours installing them, Right? And then wonder why your network's been penetrated 16 times when your IP's gone out of the network. You know, well, you, you did two hours effort. The hacker did a little bit more. As we like to say, it's better safe than sorry.